welcome to How to Go Independent. I'm your host, Sean Kernan. Today I've got an interview with a longtime independent advisor, Ashley Hodge. I met Ashley several years before I went independent as I was calling around to make sure I understood all the different possibilities before I made some decisions or got too serious about my transition plan. And the reason I was introduced to him as the recruiter for the independent broker dealer I'm associated with recommended I talk to him because I was curious about working from home. Uh, I've never used my home office as my primary office, but I was considering the idea, was curious about it. And so Ashley was held out as an example of someone who had grown their business working from home. As you'll hear in the interview, he's built a pretty substantial and impressive business with home office and no full-time staff. In fact, no real staff at all. So I will say he's probably the exception. He's not the typical work at home with no assistant advisor from my observation and experience. However, it shows that it's not an impediment. It doesn't have to be uh, a restriction on growing the business. So listen closely as you hear Ashley talk about how he's really uh, built his business around his life and his values, what he wanted from his, his life as he knew it would change, starting a family. And I think you'll find it very valuable and useful. So without further ado, here's Ashley Hodge. Today I'm joined by Ashley Hodge. Ashley is an independent advisor, spent time at wirehouses and, and went independent about uh, 12 years ago. So Ashley, thanks for joining me. Glad to be on. Well, Ashley, you know, why don't we go ahead and, and get right to it and why don't you tell us a little bit about your background and sort of in the business and otherwise and, and kind of how you ended up uh, looking to go independent way back when. Sure. I, I started in the business in 1993. I was I worked for Merrill Lynch for six years in Fort Worth. And then I moved to a, a small regional firm, J.C. Bradford, in 1999 and went through a series of buyouts. Payne Weber was the first one and then UBS after that. And so I had a, some contract obligations until about 2004, and in 2004, I decided to go independent. And so that was when I made the launch into the world of being an independent financial advisor. So how long did you kind of take a look at that before you pulled the trigger, and, and what did you do to prepare for it? Well, it, it's interesting. I, I, the business was evolving you know, around the, the age of the Internet, you know, certainly – Telecommuting, working from home became more of a, a viable option. So I started actually working from home probably in 2001. And I just knew that I was very much to have children, uh, raising a family, quality of life. I, I thought that that would provide the highest quality life. So I decided that that's the direction I wanted to go in 2001. So, you know, really started implementing, you know, all my business practices to, to try to make that a reality. And then 2004 made the jump and I was really glad that I did. Okay. I, and that's funny. I didn't realize that. I know that's a big thing I want to talk to you about at some point. I didn't realize you were doing that at the, as an employee. So I assume they were not excited if you were going to, they were, that wasn't really an option to do that full time. I'm guessing. Oh, uh, they, I, I, I didn't get much kickback from it, but it wasn't encouraged. I, I would say my, attendance at weekly sales meetings was pretty sporadic and I'm sure the the manager uh, was was wasn't happy about that but but you know really it was it was it just suited me well you know I've I've always received more energy from dealing with clients and and just trying to be more productive with my time versus actually talking to coworkers I I, I like my coworkers and you know and enjoyed the office environment to some degree but you know, when I started to really evaluate it, there's just so much time wasted, two-hour lunches, talking about the, the weekend sporting events. I mean, <laughs> you know, I, when I looked at – when I started doing time logs, which was about 2001, 2002, you know, I just started evaluating, okay, take out the commute, take out the two-hour lunches, take out the, you know, 45 minutes recapping all the sporting action from, from the weekend. Uh, you know, you're you're killing a big portion of the day here, so – and that's that's really what motivated me to make that make that move. 
Excellent. And and just for context, where in the, where part of of the Fort Worth metroplex were you, where were you living at that point? How far were you driving? Well, yeah, that's an interesting question because I I, I lived in Fort Worth and in South Lake, but at the same time that I was wrestling with these ideas, I actually decided I didn't have kids at the time, and I decided I was going to start taking seminary classes at a local Dallas theological seminary. And so we moved to Dallas. And so I was actually working out of the Fort Worth office, living in Dallas. Oh, wow. You know, so that was that was a big motivation for officing from home. But then gotcha. you know, it was it was the plan that once I was able to work through that contract that I was gonna make the jump in two thousand four. So so I, I made all those moves with, with that in mind that that was eventually going to be my landing spot. Excellent. Okay, so you so you sort of had a several year time horizon that you were looking at the the earliest opportunity that made sense, right? Given that contract to make the move, correct. Okay, and then you know when you decide to pull the pull the plug and, and make the move, how did that go? You know how did, how did the clients receive it, and sort of uh, anything lessons learned for those that are looking at that today that that stick out? You know, it's it's a different environment. You know, things change, but yeah, from a, some things stay the same. Right. Well, you know, I think that if if you're thinking in terms of two or three years ahead, you know, you, you, you do things different than, than if you just make a rash move, obviously. You know, so I the transition was actually very smooth. I, I made a transition from Merrill Lynch to this small regional firm, and it was the first time I'd ever moved firms. And that was a messy transition. Ended up being sued by Merrill Lynch. Had to go to uh, arbitration, uh, but you know there's there was a lot of extenuating circumstances. We I was the tenth employee to leave that Merrill Lynch office within the last year, so that you know that it, in hindsight that's clearly you know baiting them to to sue you you know because because at some point they want to stop the bleeding. So I had you know arbitration and and the results of that were not favorable for me, but huh. so, so the second go around, you know, I, I made sure that, you know, I, I had my ducks in a row that, that there was nothing that I did that would jeopardize my employment contract and, and that, you know, the firm wouldn't have much to stand on in terms of, you know, taking me to court to get a temporary restraining order. So, you know, I, I think it was more well thought out. I'd consulted some attorneys and, and, you know, so as, if, as a result, it was a smooth transition. That's interesting because if when you were when you were making that move, kind of between wirehouses, so to speak, or I guess that was more of a regional at the time, the one you went to, you weren't a you weren't a big huge producer for Merrill at the time, were you? No, I wasn't. I, I think I had 40, <laughs> 40 million under management, and you know, probably was doing a little over four hundred thousand in business. You know, so not not typically a, a guy that they would worry about, but but I think the fact that I was the tenth guy to leave their office in the last year, they they wanted to send a firm message to to the other employees that remained, and and so I was the guy that caught, caught that. Yeah, because that would be kind of I don't hear a ton of that when people make the move, and I don't I know you kind of. We'll talk talk about this in a while. You kind of stick to yourself and get your get your clients taken care of instead of like you said, doing what I do and talking to advisors all day or a lot of the day. Yeah. But I guess the lesson could be maybe you need to beat your coworkers out the door if you're going to make a move. <laughs> I think I think <laughs> that's a good lesson. Yes. Uh, or in some ways you just don't know until you actually pull the plug. But right. That is surprising because you know I I didn't know that about about that move and and I don't hear that happening too often. But like. Like you described, you just don't know. Each circumstance is unique. Interesting. Well, and you know, and just to be totally transparent, I, I think a lot of it had to do with the fact that when you move from a brokerage firm to a brokerage firm, oftentimes there's, you know, at the time, I don't know if they still do this, but there was some pretty significant upfront bonuses being paid to make that move. And so, you know, I think the difference between going from a brokerage firm to independent is, that, is you know, obviously you get a higher payout with independent, uh, but there's no upfront significant compensation. So, you know, the, the firms can't e as easily claim damage when 
you know, when, when there when there's an upfront payment being made, it's it's easy to say, okay, well we've been damaged, and you know, here's here's proof, you know, this person's receiving, you know, this this amount of compensation for moving. But if you're if you're going independent, and you're not receiving that upfront bonus, then it's a different story. Gotcha. Yeah, it's a good, great point. And yeah, that still I think happens, and you know, things evolve a little bit. But my understanding of those wirehouse to wirehouse moves. I think that's one reason a lot of people don't look at the independent model as closely is the, there's some money involved these days, but right. not nothing like nothing like that you would be uh, when you have a 10 year commitment to your right. next employer. Right. OK, very yeah. interesting. And then so so it sounds like your retention on the second move was was relatively high, at least from from what you were looking for. Um, what was your kind of the how did you position it? And then, you know, tell us a little bit about the, the specifics in terms of, you know, how you got set up and, and yeah. kind of where you went from there. Well, you know, I, I, I don't remember specifically telling my clients that I was changing firms, but, but I did plant seeds. Uh, you know, one of the seeds that I planted, which was, which was a genuine motivation was, you know, I told them that I wanted to cut out a lot of the overhead and I wanted to get into a very inexpensive cost structure. And, and, and so doing that, that I would be able to, charge less than I would, than I could charge at the full brokerage firms. So, you know, as I was thinking about what kind of business I wanted to run and the types of clients I wanted to attract, you know, I really focused on three things. One was providing value, not only from a cost perspective, but, you know, to be able to impart some wisdom from over 10 years at the time and now over 20 years of, of experience in the investment business. And then the you know second thing I wanted to do was just focus on stewardship, and I, I had a passion for you know specifically biblical stewardship and and how that could you know play out of you know living living out your faith and and you know focusing on uh, simple living and a, you know generous life. You know those those two things were a passion of mine, and then. You know, third thing is, well, I guess I just covered it. I mean, you know, focus on value from an from an advice standpoint, but also from a from a cost perspective. You know, I wanted, I I felt like if a client had a certain amount of money, that I would want to be able to cap my fee and not not charge any more than that. And at the time, you know, I did it because it was a, I thought a right thing to do, but it ended up being a pretty successful marketing ploy as well, because you know that a lot of people would spread the word that you know I was charging quite a bit less than other advisors at, at a certain, you know, asset break point. Yeah, very interesting. Can you touch a little bit on that last point in terms of the, you know, how you outline that and kind of what the appeal to the client is and and sort of, you know, how, how do you go about that? That is, I always find that interesting in talking to you, how you how you implement that. Well, yeah, so, you know, the the big conviction I had was just that, I wouldn't charge more than $10,000 in asset fees to any client, regardless of asset size. So, you know, typically if you have a client that has 2 million plus, you know, obviously at 2 million, that would be a half a percent. But, but as, as the numbers get higher, if, if you have clients that have 5 million, 10 million, you know, you can slide that asset fee down, you know, to, make it really competitive and, you know, was able to land some clients against some pretty lofty competition. You know, one guy I talked to, you know, had been heavily courted by Goldman Sachs, but I mean, you know, you just, there, there was just no comparison, you know, from, from a fee perspective, you know, I was, I was able to blow away their fees by, by sticking to that policy. Very good. And then do you have, what would you say to the, if everyone were to say, Hey, you, you're discounting your value and that sort of thing. How do you, how do you answer that? I would assume you've had people tell you that or, or the thought has crossed your mind or you've read that elsewhere. Yeah. Well, I, I mean, I think every client, you know, obviously the more assets you have, there's going to be some, some added complexity uh, to it. But I mean, you know, if you're, if you're officing from home and your overhead's low, most of that ten thousand dollar fee you're you're taking you know to to the house so i mean it's it gets to be a question of you know what what is your time worth and 
and are, are you really going to spend, you know, that much time to justify $25,000 fee, $30,000 fee? Um, for me, the answer was no. You know, I, th I thought that, you know, 10000 as a as a max was, was a very fair, you know, fee structure for, for some of the more complicated or, you know, higher asset clients. And, you know, it's, it, it's like anything in this business. What I found is when you take on a new client, a lot of the work is the first couple of years as you establish the plan, you know, do a lot of planning, you know, get to know each other, more frequent meetings. But then after that, you know, first couple of years, then, then the, the actual amount of work, you know, starts to decline. So, you know, I think you, you definitely, if you have a happy client from a fee perspective and, and they're going to tell other people about it, I, I think it's, it's a win-win situation. Yeah, that's interesting. And I think, I would think the, the economics of independence, especially the way you're doing it, make that a whole different ball game than sort of the, the firms that you and I came from where that $10,000 the client pays nowhere near all, nowhere near all that goes to the bottom line. Yeah. Um, you're, yeah. That make, Oh yeah, I mean, you, at a Merrill Lynch, I mean, you're probably talking, uh, you know, with with all the, you know, the fees that they'll layer on. I mean, I I would guess that you know, the the advisor would take home maybe twenty five hundred of that, you know. Uh, you know, the payout maybe forty forty one percent, but then they they have some additional haircuts in there, <laughs> where where they would it would on advisory business where it would lower that even more. So, yeah, it's it's a whole different ball game for sure. Great. And then on the other two points that sort of are probably more, uh, more, even more near and dear to your heart, you know, talking about imparting value and wisdom and, and living out your faith. Um, how does that manifest itself when you come across that, you know, maybe the referral or potential client or existing client for that matter, who, who you realize at some point, maybe that, that doesn't fit as well with what you are, what you feel is most important. How do you, how do you handle that, or does it come up very often? You know, it's a great question. I, I think that back in 2001, you know, I, I probably had more idealistic thoughts of, of what that might look like and, and how I would uh, run my practice and, and integrate faith into my practice. As, as time goes on, you know, I think that there are definitely clients that that connects with and, and they, they want to seek that type of advice from you. But I would say, you know, of my client base currently, you know, maybe 25% would, would really actively want that type of advice, you know, incorporating, you know, how to give and, and, you know, lifestyle issues, Christian worldview. But the other 75% just want someone who's honest, they can trust that they like that'll manage their their funds and and be a good steward over their funds. So, you know, I don't think it's inconsistent for that other 75%. I, I think there's some respect as long as they see that it's authentic. But the you know the 20, the 25 percent you know really it resonates with them and you know they want to be uh, generous. They want to live for you know a Christian worldview. They want to they want to advance the kingdom of God, so to speak. So, you know, those, you know, there's, there's more vibrant conversations about that, but the other 75% are like, you know, I don't want a sermon, just, just you know, <laughs> give, give me solid advice, charge me a fair fee and, and take care of, take care of me and, you know, seek to, you know, manage this money like you would manage your own money. So I, you know, I try to implement that and, and just, you know, be the, be the best advisor to everyone that I can. And, and, you know, just as, as those conversations come up, you know, I'm glad to entertain them, but I'm, I'm not as uh, forceful to try to force a square peg into a round hole that I've made, than maybe I was, in, you know, 10 years ago. Okay. Yeah. That's interesting. That's, that's, I think that gives at least me personally sort of hope that the idea of having this very narrow that's a that's a wonderful i don't know if it's a niche per se that's that's not exactly what i think from a marketing perspective we think of a niche but it's it's more about you know not having to sacrifice your your personal values and what's important for you as the advisor right as you're working with people but 
yeah, that it's that squares with a lot of experience in general. That you know, there are there are clients who really want to kind of share everything and have us help them think through bigger picture issues. But yeah, many just want, hey, take care of me. And I think your faith probably is is you know serves you well in, in doing that. But they, yeah, that makes sense that not everyone's looking for that kind of relationship. Um, right. Very very good. Interesting. Uh, you know, and I will say though, I because I've had a few of these situations come up recently. I, I do think it's it's always interesting that for those who might be listening that are you know inclined this way and and have you know a Christ, Christian belief system, you know, people people watch. You know, I had a client that I mean just ripped my heart out. She got at age you know 58, I think she was, she got diagnosed with a terminal brain tumor. And, you know, she's one that I never really had these conversations with, but immediately as we, as we started to have some pretty, you know, emotional, deep conversations after that diagnosis, she had mentioned, you know, hey, I've, I've always noticed, you know, that, you know, your faith is important to you and, and I've always respected that about you. I mean, you know, the, the, those, those conversations come up, I think, in times of, of distress or times of change or you know, life changes. So, um, you know, it's, it's one of those things where, you know, I've been encouraged lately that, you know, just consistency and, and not shying away from it, but at the same time, you know, you don't want to, you, you certainly don't want to, you know, shine the lights too bright either. I mean, you, you, you want to have a, a good balanced approach to it to where people know that's who you are, but, but you're, you're there to serve them. So you're not there to, you know, force something that, that they don't want. Right. Well, that, that's a yeah, that's a great story, and you know, not a great story, but it, it's it's good that people know who you're about. I guess that is sort of part of what I do now. I don't try to. Um, I don't think if you've been independent for a while, you maybe we forget that newer advisors or maybe those who are in the employee model think they need to try and please everyone, and uh, it just seems to me when you can afford to only take on clients who you really feel good about working with and who seem to appreciate what you do. Mm-hmm. It just seems to make life a lot more fulfilling. And, and I think we do better, better work that way yeah. as well. And also, you know, if someone did want to make evangelization sort of the primary focus, they just probably need to think that through from, you know, that's going to draw a line where you may turn off some other clients who otherwise would be fine with, you know, knowing that, but sure. you know, who might get, "Quote unquote uncomfortable." That goes for anything we do. If we say we focus on a particular type of client and that client doesn't fit that profile, but I think that's you know you just as long as you can build the practice the way you want to, which we can where we are, that's a wonderful wonderful freedom to have. Right. Now tell me a little bit about your off situation. I know you work from home, and that was I think one reason we got linked up when I was looking at uh, the different independent options. Uh, trying to decide what I wanted to do office-wise, the uh, the recruiter for the firm we're affiliated with said, "Hey, this guy has done a great job working from home and hasn't slowed him down." Right. Uh, so tell us, you know, kind of how you're set up, and you know, what are the pros and cons? And I know you've got kids that are still fairly young, so you know, how do you how do you get work done at the house? You know, how, talk yeah. to the, the person that doesn't get that. You know, how how do how do you operate? Well, I, it, there has to be some intentionality about it, no question. When I when I moved to Dallas, the house setup wasn't ideal, and especially for having young kids, which we had at the time. So there was a it was a three bedroom house, and then had an office, and the office was right in the middle of the house, and it had two French doors, so you could see all the action, and the kids could see you. And I'll never forget that I got a really good referral one day, and was talking to the referral. It was like a $3 million client. And my son comes in to the office, opens the door, has a poopy diaper in his hand and says, poopy, poopy. <laughs> and so uh, obviously that's not the impression you want to make on a, on a client that you're talking to prospective client that you're talking to for the first time. I actually got them as a client, by the way. Uh, but you know, it's now I, I've, I've moved to Hearst. Fort Worth side, and I built an office. I built, we built our house, and the office was built with a lot of intentionality in mind. So it's on the other side of the house, at the back. 
It's got a door that's extra thick. The walls are extra thick. It's got a lock on the door. And and so my kids, you know, I've been officing from home for so long. They just know that from eight o'clock to six, you know, daddy's probably going to be in his office. And, and, you know, there's times during the day I, I'll come out and have lunch with them and we homeschool our kids. So I actually am the math professor for, <laughs> for my son. So I, I, I spend some time during the day doing math with them, but you know, other than that, it's it's pretty much you know I try to keep a very uh, disciplined approach, and you know I I'm big on don't start the next day until you have it finished. You know, set goals, you know, to do list, and and so I you know and 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 my goal is pretty simple. I I want to have three quality client reviews every day, and I think if I do that, everything will take care of itself. You know, if, if you're if you're trying to touch three clients a day in some way. And you do that consistently, I think everything else takes care of itself. And and I found that to be true. And and where my business is slumped is usually when I get away from that and when I lose sight of that, you know, that it's that it's all about having three quality client reviews, whether they be face to face or on the phone or by email. You know, if you do that consistently, good things will happen. Yeah, it's funny because you know, that sounds you know, if you if you have really ambitious People sometimes you think three sounds low, but you do the math, and even with some vacation in it, that's a lot of that's a lot of when you say quality, you know, that's a lot of quality time with clients, talking to them or meeting with them or you know sending emails, whatever the case may be. That's I don't know what that is six seven hundred a year. So right, you know, you divide that by your client base, and and it's just a matter of the consistency, I would think. Yeah, and if you do it right, it's it's probably an hour and a half of work or prep preparation per client, you know, to do that. So, you know, you're talking four and a half to five hours. Obviously that doesn't include things that come up during the day, like, you know, just the, the normal routine administrative tasks that you have to do every day or responding to clients, you know, that's more reactive. But, but I, you know, if I focus on those proactive things and, and carve out that time, you know, what I found is, you know, really, you know, referrals come and you have happier clients and, you know, you, it, it's, it, you know, it's just, it's just as simple as that. And, and when I was at Merrill Lynch, there was an advisor that, you know, even said, I do one client review a day, just do one client review a day. Now he had a mature practice and I just thought, man, how lazy is that? <laughs> that he just does one client review a day. But, you know, when you get 20 years in the business, you can see how, you know, that could, that you could have days where you don't do that, you know, where you just kind of drift. And, and so I think that, you know, being intentional is critical, especially if you're going to work from home, because, because you don't have anyone to really spur you on, you know, you have to, you have to be more intentional about it. Right. Yeah. And, you know, there's always, as long as you're responding quickly to the inbound stuff, you know, that, that always, you know, helps with the maintenance and, and the, quality time you spend with clients to hopefully, but yeah. uh, that's, that's interesting. And you mentioned doing the administrative stuff. Now tell me about all the staff you have in place to manage the business that you've grown. <laughs> I have a, a staff of one and, and many hundreds of people that are behind the scenes, you know, using the scale of, of investment companies that I do business with or, you know, the, the company that we clear our business with, uh, LPL, you know, just, you know, using their scale and, and their expertise, you know, you can, you know, and, and with technology, I think you can get away without having an assistant, but, you know, it, it has its challenges. I, I just, I just found that I was always the type of person that didn't manage people very well. And so knowing that weakness about myself, I just decided to go without an assistant and, you know, a lot of times taking ownership of a lot of the administrative tasks, which are a whole lot easier now that we have, you know, paperless documents and DocuSign and, and able to, you know, scan in faxes. And, you know, I mean, it's, it's way less labor intensive uh, than it was 10 years ago. But, but I just found that, you know, doing it myself, you know, there was, the buck stopped with me. I got to know the client's situation a little better, you know, as, as you input the paperwork, you're, you're, getting more familiar with the client. So it's worked well for me to, to go without an assistant. Awesome. Yeah. And I've, I've always been impressed with that. And 
I could see you, you're kind of my hero in that you can see it can be done and uh, people that make excuses about I need this office or I need this staff to do get things done. It's a lot of it. I think it's just pure organization and and kind of discipline. Right. And so it's always good to hear that what can be done, even if even if I don't want to do it myself necessarily that way. I, I like to have you in particular as an example. Do you mind sharing a little bit, but kind of the, at least in rough terms, what kind of the scale of your practice so people can appreciate what you're able to, what you've been able to build, either in terms of assets or you know, whatever. Yeah. You sure. Well, it, it's a little over a hundred million in assets, and I have probably somewhere in the 120 households as far as uh, clients that I that I serve. You know, so it's, so that's those are pretty accurate number somewhere in that ballpark great yeah so it's it's and you've been able to grow that fairly significantly in the 10 years or what 11 12 years you've been independent right yeah so you know i I think i mentioned earlier that when i left merrill lynch i had 40 million dollars um well i i only took a portion of that over to the new firm because because of the lawsuit and i actually had a one-year non-compete that was enforced so I think I left paying our UBS with about 25 million. So, you know, that was that was, you know, from a from a starting point, you know, was was not bringing a lot of assets over. But in the 10 years, I've been able to grow that from 25 to over 100. So it's 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 been a tremendous. I, I think it just re-energized me a lot, really. You know, I. You know, in 2001 to 2004, I, you know, I, I didn't have a lot of enthusiasm for the business, and and it showed. You know, you can never fake that. And and in 2004, when I went independent and was doing my own thing, and you know, had myself to answer to, you know, it's, it, it, you know, you got away from a lot of the bureaucratic issues that you have with a, with a larger organization. I think it just totally re-energized me, and and. You know, so the growth came because of that. That's awesome. Yeah, congratulations on doing that, especially doing it the kind of the way you want to and with, you know, relatively minimal distractions. I know it's a lot of work to to build and maintain that when you're you're it, but that's impressive. What do you have any favorite tools that help you kind of keep on top of things or, or technology that's evolved over the last many years that sort of sticks out as, as you couldn't do without it at this point? Well, let's see. What do I use? I I definitely am a big fan of eMoney Advisor and try to get all my – I use it religiously myself for, you know, budgeting, keeping track of expenses, setting goals, you know, keeping I, – I eat my own cooking, you know, so what I preach to my clients, I, I definitely try to implement myself, you know, so, uh, and I have a lot of clients that love it. You know, I, I, I think every client should use it, but it's, you know, a lot of them have the attitude of that's what I hire you for. <laughs> I don't, I don't want to keep track of this stuff. So, you know, that's a great tool. I also use Metro Fax. You know, this, it, faxes are becoming less and less frequent. You know, more and more companies are taking email scans, but you know, I, I, for the companies that still have to fax stuff too, I, I use Metro Fax, so I don't have a fax machine. It's just I just scan documents in either to my phone or to my laptop and then pay eight ninety five a month to, you know, have this designated fax number. And, then, you know, lately I've I just I've spent some time this year setting up a new office system. I, 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 you and I met playing basketball, and I, I still was playing a lot of basketball up until two or three months ago, and you know, I've had a herniated disc. So, so my latest my latest venture has been getting one of these desks that converts from a sitting desk to a standing desk, and so I replaced my computer, got a laptop, using a docking station. And so I've gotten rid of all my files and all my drawers now. So now I'm I'm a, I am 100% paperless, and you know I, I I keep some paper files that I have to keep for compliance reason in my closet. But 
but everything uh, else is is digital. So you know, I think I think embracing you know the digital, uh, you know, 100% paperless office. If you're going to do it the way I've done it, is is a pretty important thing. Otherwise, you're going to, you know, it's it's going to be tough to manage from a space perspective, and and you know just you know so so those are the those are the main tools that I've embraced. Okay, good. Uh, yeah, I'm sorry to hear about your back. I didn't know about that. I know that's not not fun at all, and I know, yeah, you've been pretty consistent with the bat playing basketball for all those years. So that's I'm sure that's that's not comfortable to to deal with. Yeah. It crushed my NBA aspirations. But, uh. <laughs> how, how did Baylor do this year? By the way, did they have a decent year? I, I didn't. They I didn't had they had a pretty good year. They they lost in the first round of the tournament to an Ivy League school. I'll, I'll, I'll say. Oh, that's that. right. That, that, that was not good. I, I, I didn't mean that wasn't supposed to be a set you up to. No, that's right. Yale, Yale had a very good team, and and uh, Baylor had trouble uh, containing their sophomore. Point guard. He, I think he had 30 points against Baylor. So that was that was not a good end of the season, but but a but a pretty good year overall. Yeah, Ashley's a very big uh, supporter and and uh, very interested in Baylor basketball. That's an uh, understatement, right? Yes, yeah. yes. Um, and then you know you've already touched on it quite a bit, but I just want to highlight it for people that. And they think of going independent, which I've been debating, is that the right term even, or what does it mean? Because, you know, I think a lot of people that are don't really dig into the option or options because it sounds intimidating. You know, if we think about our country going independent, you know, you had to fight a war to get there and right. set up a whole new government, et cetera, start from scratch. But how much time do you spend kind of running the business? You know, it's just you and you've built a substantial practice so right obviously you've done a good job of it can you give us a sense of you know how intimidating it is it to go from you know being an employee and having people to do that stuff to to do it your own or hiring someone to do it it's an adjustment period i i think that it takes about two years to really hit the groove to where to where you feel like going from a wirehouse to an independent broker that you know that there's no difference in, as far as the amount of time and the amount of effort. You know, I when I look back, I mean, it, perhaps it's experience, but it just seems like there there was so much time wasted. You know, I I'll, I'll speak at Merrill Lynch, and you know, Merrill Lynch was was a good firm. They had you know a lot of, of, of I mean, they I, I don't want to you know necessarily badmouth them, but but I, I will make the comment that. You know, when you would call for support at the time, it may have changed since then. I mean, you know, so many of the people that you had talked to just treated it as a job. And and, and so as, as a result, you just got stuck in this black hole of service, you know. So if you had to call and get a client situation taken care of, you know, it was past the buck, past the buck. No one wanted to take responsibility for it. And, you know, I think with the independent firms, at least my experience with LPL has been that, there's been just much more of an ownership, you know, more of a mindset from the top down that, you know, these are your clients, you know, just like, you know, when we serve our clients and if a client calls up, you're not just going to say, oh, hey, let me get to that next week. You know, you're going to try to take care of that issue right now and right then. Well, you know, the same thing I found is true, you know, from a service perspective, being independent, there's just a lot more ownership of problems. So from that standpoint, you know, your your frustration and the time you spend actually goes down, you know, which I've been really happy about. So I, I would say there's a two-year adjustment period, but now, you know, I'm sure that the amount of work that I'm putting in and the amount of time that I'm putting in, certainly, if you if you add up commuting and sales meetings and all the stuff that you have to do at a at a wirehouse is is you know equal or or less than than to the wirehouse years. Okay, very good. Yeah, and I think the one of the interesting things I find is in talking to you and a bunch of other independent advisors before I kind of made the move myself, just all the different ways you can kind of set up a business to solve those challenges. So whether that's you want to hire a bunch of assistants because you want to have file cabinets and someone to greet people when they walk in the door, and you can you can have as much or as little staff as you want 
you know, and you can have as much or as little office space as you want, assuming you can afford all that overhead. If it's not really for you or me necessarily, but right. you know, there are people who like to have the accoutrements and it can be expensive, but there's no one going to tell you, no, you can't do that until you do 1.72 million of production or whatever the, whatever the random arbitrary, right. you know, benchmark that a, that a firm has established. But yeah, th- I think learning new systems is definitely and, and figuring out how to kind of get things done is there's always going to be an adjustment. And for better or worse, you know, you are independent. We are independent day to day. So no one is going to kind of babysit us to make sure we get our stuff done as much. There's certainly compliance, but it's it's a different environment to say the least. Right. And, and then, well, I, I was going to make the comment that you know it's impossible to eliminate stress. You know, stress is is obviously going to be a natural part of any work environment. But you know, I I've always been big on you know w- w- begin with the end in mind. You know, what's what lifestyle is is going to bring about you know the most peace and the, the least amount of stress you know over time, and and so you know most of the bu- business decisions I try to make are with that in mind, and you know I th- I think certainly for me, even though it sounds you know frightening to some people to to give up the security of the big company and the employee status, certainly being independent has been been much less stressful. And more more financially rewarding too, but you know it's I, th- I think if people you know really look at you know how can I set my business up and and make it as simple as possible, and if that's the goal, you know I, I think a lot of them come to these conclusions that you know there there are better ways to do things that you know just just because there's you know layers of people that you have to go through to get get things done at the wirehouse doesn't mean that's the right way to do it. Yeah. Amen. One other major kind of issue that I, I know concerns people that I wanted to kind of talk to you about. I tried to ask most advisors that I have on, how do you, how do you get health insurance for your family? Does your wife yeah. uh, have a corporate cushy job? I guess not if she's <laughs> homes, homeschooling the kids or helping homeschool, but how do you handle that for your family? Well, that's a complicated issue in our household because unfortunately my wife has neurological problems. So she is considered a separate entity. She's actually on Medicare because she's got a a long-term disability. So we, my kids and I are on, on our own policy and I've all, I've done it through uh, ehealthinsurance.com. And, you know, I would say that my, satisfaction with that was high before Obamacare <laughs> and probably much lower after Obamacare, you know, because, you know, the price and the level of care is, has declined and, and the prices have gone way up. You know, I know that something I've looked into last year, and I, I may take the jump next year and do it, is I, I've, I've had clients and, you know, people that I know that have spoken real highly of, you know, some of these health sharing organizations. There's one called MediShare and another one called Samaritan. I, I, I forget the, the other part of that name, but have you heard about this, Sean? Is this- yeah, a little bit. In fact, one of the guys that works with me has done that, and so far his experience has been pretty positive. Yeah. But Yeah, so, I, so that's an option I'm going to look into. It's basically, you know, much lower monthly fees, but it's it's not it's not health insurance. It's you know, a commitment to share each other's expenses if you commit to a, you know, certain lifestyle behaviors, you know, not smoking, you know, not uh, excessive drinking, you know, no drug use, you know, faithful, you know, to your spouse, you know, those are the kind of things we're asking for, for from a, you know, commitment standpoint. Um, you know, so I, I, and that's interesting to me and I'm going to look into it, but, but right now I've been using e-health insurance and, uh, I'm with United Healthcare currently. And is your uh, that's funny uh, that's I, I don't know if I got that from you or just from from the recruiters that we would have both talked to over, when we made the moves that's that's exactly where mine is. Yep. Has ha, are do you still you still have the existing policy? Have they given you any the way I read these letters it says maybe we can only keep it through October of 17 is have you read between the lines or is that what you understand or have you looked at that closely? 
Well, I've I've actually been bounced around a little bit. I I had Blue Cross Blue Shield through e health insurance, and they stopped offering the plan that I was on. Okay. When the Affordable Health Care Act was was enacted, and so I think I think it's been United Healthcare the last two years, but you know I, I have an HSA account and I, I maximize that every year, and then I pay for insurance on top of that. You know, all, all told, it's probably eleven hundred a month if if you include the the HSA. You know, the maximizing the HSA account. So, you know, it's 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 not it's not a terrible policy, but you know, being relatively healthy and someone who doesn't go to the doctor very much, it 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 seems like there could be better options out there. It's it's you know, with with the Affordable Health Care Act, you're just having to pay for you're kind of forced to pay for more than you need. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. And the way I've tried to position that or explain to advisors is unfortunately or fortunately, depending on how you view it, that doesn't appear to be unique. That that challenge to being an employee or being self-employed, it, it seems to be consistent across the board that costs are going up. There might be some sharing a little bit with, with an employer. But if you if you look at that in terms of oh, we say, look, here's what's costing you as an employee. If you're self-employed, yes, it might cost you more. But let's not look at the total cost. Look at only the delta, right? And then compare that to your your gross top line. You know what what's going to show up in your bank account before expenses? And it's it's the math is kind of silly. It's it's obviously more than enough to cover the the, the delta from from what I see. Yeah, I mean it's it, it's just crazy sometimes the mental traps that you get into. You know, you, you hear some resistance on healthcare insurance, or you know, I'm going to have to pay my portion of the Social Security, the employer tax, or you know, I I get invited on this trip every year, and and the big brokerage firm pays for me to go to go on this trip every year. You know, those things you're saving pennies to lose dollars. I mean, it just, it just doesn't make good financial sense. So, I mean, like you said, at the end of the day, what I found is, you know, what you take to the bottom line increases substantially, and then you can make your decisions on how you want to allocate your money from there. You know, all the, all these benefits, you know, if you're, if you're making 90% payout or 70% or payout or whatever the case may be versus making a, a 30% payout, you know, they, they, they tend to get pretty small, pretty quick. Yeah. It makes me understand a little bit more why any firm has these different pieces of compensation, all the behavioral finance stuff kind of teaches us. We all like to have lots of little positive hits. Right. And even those of us that should be able to do math pretty well if we're in, in this business, don't always, don't always even if we're doing it, we don't seem to acknowledge that, yeah, it's kind of, a, like you said, a mental trap. And there are other reasons people don't make a move. They're comfortable. It, there's there's fear. There's, hey, I, I, I inherited a bunch of clients at, at the big Mother Merrill type firm. You know, and that's okay, but the math is, it's pretty straightforward when, when you look at, you know, if you can, if your clients will move with you, which we would hope most of us, if we do a decent job, they would, they would go with us. Right. Um. Okay, is there anything else that that you want to touch on that we haven't had a chance to talk about or, or anything, you know, if you had to do something different in your career or that you don't like about being independent, you know, what else haven't we touched on that you think would be critical for, you know, someone that might listen to this? Well, I would say for any younger advisor that's maybe been in the business for 10 years or less, I, I think – you know, the old adage that, you know, do what you love and the money will follow is, is true to some degree. I mean, I think that, you know, if you, if you become passionate about things and, and you surround yourself with quality people, that, that tends to be who you attract as clients. I know that even though it hasn't been my intention, you know, going into it to, to get clients per se, but, you know, just through basketball and, and you know, supporting Baylor athletics and, and teaching Bible studies on finances at churches. And, you know, I, if I look back at my client base, a lot of my best clients come from those three areas. And so I think, you know, more than just concentrating on 
and and I, and I also think that's where in, in independent helps because you don't want to you don't want to office from home and stay in your home all day. I mean, you, you definitely want to have activities that are you know getting you in front of people and getting out in the community. And if you can do things that you're passionate about, do things you love, you know, I do think it's it's not going to be an immediate payoff, you know, as far as business, but it, you know, it's do it consistently and people see that they, they know you, they like you and they trust you, you know, they, they'll tend to do business with you. So, you know, I, I would just give that advice that design the life you want to design and, and, you know, go for it. Yeah, I think that's great advice. Well, actually, I really, really appreciate your time. I know that you're very, you're very guarded with it. Make sure you spend it wisely and that, that stewardship that you referenced. So I really appreciate you spending a little bit of it with me, and I hope I know some folks out there will benefit from it. If anybody wanted to reach out to you and had a few questions or wanted to kind of pick your brain a little bit more, how would they get a hold of you? Sure. They can email me at my personal email, which is ashleyhodge at yahoo.com. And, and I have a website. It's ashleyhodge.com, and I, my contact information is on that as well. Great. Well, thanks again, and I hope you continue success. And 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 thanks, Sean. Appreciate the time. And and let me tell you, Sean is one of the deadliest outside shooters I've ever come across. I I remember learning that the hard way. You would unlimited range. You were you were you were. Steph Curry before Steph Curry. <laughs> well, thank you. That's funny you mentioned it. I told someone the other day who used an analogy about thanking him. He thanked us for a layup or me for a layup in business. And I said, well, you better enjoy it because I usually just I just jack it up. I don't I don't. So I think he thought I was kidding, but I, you know, as you know, I was not. So well, I, yeah, I, I do remember you know playing with you, and, and I said, Sean, I'm open, and you said, I don't see you sitting on the rim. I mean, you kept saying that to me. Now now it makes more sense. Yeah, just get the rebound. Ashley's what, about 6'3", <laughs> six, 6'4". Six, you just get the rebound in, on the, in case I miss, right? <laughs> That's right. All right, have a good right, weekend. Thank you. Talking thank you. To you. All right, take care. Take care. Well, there you have it. Hope you enjoyed that conversation with Ashley. As I mentioned in the intro, I think he's just a great example of what's possible when you're focused on what you're trying to accomplish and you're building your business around your life. Think he certainly planned ahead and the benefits that he is reaping from that and will continue to reap the rest of his career are so significant. I would encourage you, if you're not sure the model you're in now is is where you want to be forever, start thinking and planning. You don't have to make a change tomorrow, but you know, given enough time and thought and talking to the right people, you can really radically change your business, fit it to your life. And I think Ashley's a great example of that. So um, glad to have him on the show. That's all for today. Thanks again for joining me. If you have any comments or questions, feedback, complaints about the show, shoot me an email at sean at indiefa.com. And we'll see you next time.